All right, so our next lab activity is going to be on micropipetting. So there's a lot of equipment on the table that you guys need to become familiar with. We'll be using it a little bit later on in the year. So if you're not doing it now, hopefully when we get back to school with everybody, fingers crossed, um, we'll be doing gel electrophoresis, we'll be doing e-gels, and we'll be utilizing these micropipettes. And it's a good technique to see because you see them quite often now, and depending on what field of science you may want to go into, or if you don't, you may utilize these. So every time you turn on the news, they have something coming on about COVID and about vaccines and how scientists are working with it. And every time you watch the news, you probably see scientists working with these as they're going through the news story and they're showing you how they're producing vaccines. This is your micropipette. And what this micropipette does is it measures very small amounts. So it can measure one one millionth of a liter. So think about that liter bottle of soda. These can measure extremely teeny tiny amounts. And why do we need to measure tiny amounts? DNA, RNA, we don't have a lot of it. Let's say you're at a crime scene and there's a minuscule amount of DNA there left behind that you have to work with or that forensic um, analysts need to work with. They have to utilize these instruments in order to get that sample to places it needs to be to run it into gel electrophoresis so they can find out the correct person or the suspect that may have done that. So we'll use these many times throughout the year. You're probably more interested or more used to using um, milliliter pipettes. So you may use the little plastic ones, bold pipettes that measure one ml. Next week when we do spectrophotometry, you guys will be using something called pie pumps, which measure up to 10 mLs. Um, so they're kind of like graduated cylinders with little measurements on the side of them that you guys will be seeing. So a couple things to notice or remember is that as you guys are looking at these pipettes, they come in a range of sizes. I'm going to kind of slide around so that you guys can see some of this. So within these pipettes, what we're going to see with these different sizes is that we have four different ones within the room. And as you're looking at them along the side, I'll pull the smallest one first, you guys are going to see a range. So this one says 2 to 20 ULs. That little UL is your microliter sign. So we can go from liters to milliliters to microliters. And as we do these conversions, you'll see them on there that you may ask you guys to do. As we go from liters to milliliters, we're going to move that decimal place three places to the right. As we go from milliliters to microliters, we go three more places to the right. So if we're going completely from liters to microliters or microliters to liters, now we're moving that decimal point six places. So there's a little conversion sheet that I want you guys to kind of go through and do, and there's some examples there for you on how to move that decimal point and thinking about which is a larger amount and which is a smaller amount. Microliters are extremely tiny. So if I have three liters of them, of, of a solution, that means I'm gonna have millions and millions of liters or microliters of that particular solution by the time we move that particular decimal point. So this one can measure anywhere from two to 20 microliters. I wanna make sure that I stay within my range. And what I mean by that is as we're looking at this one, this one can measure five to 50 microliters. This is my viewing window. This is how I set it. So right now, this particular one can fit, will hold 47.5. That's what it's set on to hold in terms of microliters. That number has to be within this range. Can I cheat and say, oh, I need to pull up 51. Let me go through and start turning the numbers and it will turn to 51. Sure, I can get the 51.5. Eventually, I'm gonna jam the top of it and I can't go any farther. Well, what's that doing to the machine? I'm breaking the calibration inside. These are finely tuned instruments. We're talking about minuscule amounts, one one millionth of a liter. So there's my five to 50. Next, we have a larger one. This is my 20 to 200. Notice it's set right now to 127. So middle of the range within that particular one. And then I have a much larger micropipetter and that larger micropipetter can fit anywhere from 100 to 1,000 microliters. And right now that is set on 450 microliters. So you have micropipetters that will overlap. So you can use certain ones for certain things, some others you can't. You guys should notice also my two smallest ones for these particular ones we have in class, they actually will have decimal point numbers in them. So this two to 20, there's 18.5, there's 18, there's 17.5. So it has 0.5 decimal. You can buy more exact ones that have uh, tenths places. And then my five to 50 also has my decimal point number. They're the only ones that are actually going to have decimal points. The other two within the room are only whole numbers. So I tell you guys, as you're doing this in class to kind of get used to or comfortable 
holding that particular micro pipetter in your hands. And in order to do this, um, figure out how it fits. So I usually will say go through, um, take the little hook that you have there, wrap it around your index finger and kind of wrap it around the rest of the micro pipette so that you are able to hold it. Your little thumb is now available to be put onto the plunger, which will help you to aspirate and draw up liquid as well as release liquid. And that's kind of the steps that we're gonna be going through today. Maybe you're more comfortable holding like this. I've seen people do it. Um, I'm actually left-handed, I do it right-handed. So for whatever reason, figure out what works best for you, okay? So we need to talk about some other things on the table. So with this micro pipette, one of the things that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna do something called seating a tip. So when we seat a tip, that means that we're gonna be putting a tip onto the micro pipette. So these tips are sterile and you wanna keep them sterile. And what that means is they have lids on them. We wanna make sure those lids stay on them um, because there can be contamination within the air. You have bacteria, you've got dust, you've got tons of things within the air. So keep the lids on them. Our first three micro pipetters are five to 50, our two to 20, and our 20 to 200. They will all use these small yellow tips. Our larger micro pipetter has a much fatter barrel to it they cannot fit, correctly fit, the yellow tips. So for that one, we're gonna have to use the much larger blue tips that you guys will see here, okay? They can switch, so maybe I can put this smaller one onto the blue tips, but you're not gonna measure it correctly. So let's go back to seating a tip. Once again, I don't wanna touch it with my fingers. Maybe I have stuff on my hands, maybe I have stuff on my gloves, which is gonna change my results. So I don't wanna just open it up, pick one up, and place it on. That would be wrong. So in order to seat a tip, you're gonna open up the tip box, you're gonna take your micro pipetter and you press down in the box, not a lot of muscle. And what it does is it takes a tip and it puts it on there for you. Don't wanna to touch it at this particular point, it is sterile. Once again, if I was doing my large tips, that's my 100 to 1000, it fits the blue tips. It's the only one there that will. Same thing, press down, pull out, you are good to go. Notice that when I am not using my micro pipettes, they stay in the rack. There are a couple rules. So first off, I told everybody they will lose points if I find them on the table like this. You have racks in front of you, make sure they sit in the rack. And the reason we don't want them flat on the table is because once we get our liquid in here, some sort of solution, if they're flat on the table, there's a good chance that that liquid is gonna make itself back into the barrel and change the calibration of this micro pipette. Remember, they're measuring one one millionth of a liter. So any type of contamination or substance that's gonna get in there could corrode that barrel and change our um, numbers within there. Okay, so make sure it always sticks within the rack, never lays flat, never points up to the ceiling. Uh, make sure you put your right tip onto the micro pipette that you have. So looking at the two that I have here, I'm gonna utilize the large 100 to 1000 micro pipette and the five to 50. And we did a couple little trials within class and I said, okay, if you have the five to 50, I need you guys to go through and set it to, I don't know, let's go with um, 27.5 microliters. So what they would do is they would go through, they take their little nozzle and they would start turning, make sure that you are watching within the barrel and we want to go to 27.5, which is there, right there. I have already placed the tip on this. Usually we'll do this after you set everything. So the next thing that we want to look at is there it is wrapped around my hand. We want to look at start and stop points. So this little plunger here is how we are going to aspirate and draw out the liquid. So in order to do that, we need to push down. This will go down in two points. This is my first stopping point. I say this is kind of like my no muscle point. I'm not using any muscle and I'm going down to that particular stopping point. Well, as I push down to that first point, if I add a little muscle, I can actually push down farther. So there are two stopping points, A and B. There's a reason for them. When I am aspirating out a liquid, meaning I'm drawing up a liquid, I want to go to the first stopping point. That push down there is pressing out the amount of air out of the tip that my micro pipetter is set for. So for instance, it's set for 27.5. That's what I've just depressed out of there. I go into my solution, I slowly release my thumb, and I'm gonna draw up that particular amount. We're gonna go through this with real liquid here in a moment. In order to release the liquid, I go into whatever container, maybe it's an Eppendorf tube that we're using, and I go to first push, 
but then I have to get a second push. Second push is kind of like that little extra air being pushed out, getting everything out of the tip of that syringe that we need out. If I go down to second push to draw up, then I'm gonna draw up more than what my micro pipette is set for. So if it's set for 27.5, maybe I'm drawing up 29 microliters more than what it calls for. And if you're doing something with DNA and enzymes and you're putting too much reagent in, you may have just destroyed your sample. So it's very important that um, we see that and we do the correct measurements. So in class, they'll be doing some practice with this. Uh, eventually, when we get you guys back, hopefully that we can get some practice with you guys as well. So as we go through, same thing, first and second push. I'm gonna to go to a very small number here. So here's my 100 to 1,000 microliters. I'm gonna go down to 127 microliters. And the reason I wanna go down to 127 microliters is because this is kind of the small end of this particular micro pipette. It fits anywhere from 100. Oh no, okay, so this one goes five. We're gonna go 125 on this one. Um, it fits between 100 and 1,000. So that's my small end, it fits very small amount. So what that's gonna do is if I look at my first and second push now, here's my first push. First push is very, very small because I'm displacing a small amount of air because I'm drawing up a small amount of liquid that that micro pipette can hold. So this is where it becomes a little bit more difficult to feel the difference between first push and second push. Once again, first push is to draw up or absorb the liquid second push is to release it's kind of the extra little air that you're pushing in there to push everything out of that tip there let's go to the opposite end so now let's go to 870 once again watching the viewing window making sure you're going the correct way we're going to go all the way up to the other end of it so if it's 100 to a thousand let's go to 870. and what you're going to see is that the push down button is going to get a little bit larger now there's my 870, I'm at the higher end of that. Now look at first push. Before it was very, very short. First push is all the way right there. That's a very large first push. Second push doesn't change, the same amount of air that you're used to push out. Okay, so once you set your micro pipette, you will seat a tip onto it, make sure that you don't touch it, we wanna keep it sterile. And now what we're gonna do is we wanna draw up some liquid. So we are just using food coloring and water, A, it's cheap. We don't have to worry about spending money on DNA, and this is just practice. So once again, I am gonna go to first push. I'm gonna go to first push before I go into my liquid. Think of it like blowing bubbles into a cup of like chocolate milk or something like that. If I go into this before I push the air out, I'm making bubbles in there, and I don't wanna do that. So I wanna displace my air first. I'm gonna go to first push. I'm gonna go stick my tip slightly in the solution. I don't want to go past the point where the tip and the barrel touch. It can contaminate it once again. So that's another rule. Never use your micro pipette without a tip. Never submerge the micro pipette or past the point where the tip and the micro pipette touch. So I'm going to take my tip. I'm already down at first push once again. I'm going to take the tip, put it slightly in, and I will slowly release my plunger. Don't let the plunger snap back in place. Once again, this is your plunger. You don't wanna just let that button snap back because you could suck air into it and you could also damage the micro pipette. So now I have 870 microliters into that particular tube there. So we wanna start releasing it. We have little Eppendorf tubes and these Eppendorf tubes that we have measure 1.5 milliliters. So you guys will be creating little recipes and putting different colors into them. So when I go to release it, I'm gonna take my micro pipette, I'm gonna put this against the wall of the, micro, of the Eppendorf tube. Cohesion, I need something for those substances to stick to. I'm gonna go down to first push. I'm now gonna go down to second push, get all the extra stuff out of there. I then wanna pull the tip of the micro pipette out of the solution and then slowly release my thumb. If I let go of my thumb while I'm in there, I'm gonna basically reabsorb everything I just put in there. So there is my 870 microliters of solution. This Eppendorf tube, just so you know, holds 1.5 milliliters or 1,500 uh, microliters within there. So we're about 870, so a little over halfway within that one. 
Now, we need to get rid of this tip. Same thing, I don't really wanna to touch it. So in college, I worked with radioactive isotopes and I used micropipetters a lot. So the last thing I wanna do is, even though I was in um, a hooded area, I had protective equipment on, I don't wanna to go touching the tip of it. There is a release button that you have on this. So here's my little release button. You will go over the cup and you will eject the tip into the little trash cup that you have. So nowhere along the line do you have to touch the tip, not to pull it out or see the tip onto your micropipette, not to release the tip. So we're gonna go through and do another one. So now I'm gonna take my uh, 20 to 200 micropipetter. Let's say I go to um, 27.5 microliters. So we're gonna go to 27.5. Right now I'm at the high end, so we gotta go all the way down. Actually, I'm going to 27 microliters. So the lowest I can go is 20, so I'm okay going down to 27, but notice that the nozzle is getting much smaller here. My first push up is going to be extremely small. I'm set at 27. I now want to go through and I want to see the tip. So I know that this 20 to 200 is going to use my yellow tips because the only one that's going to use the big tips is the one with the fat barrel. So my yellow tip, I go through, I see the tip, I close the container right back up again so that it stays um, sterile. And then go through and I go down to first push. So I go down to first push, I expel the air that is set for 27 microliters, I stick the tip only into the solution and I slowly release my thumb. And what we can see now is that I have exactly 27 microliters within that. What I don't want, and when we're looking at it, I have liquid from here to the end. I don't want liquid, air, liquid, air, or air at the end of the tip there. That means that you expelled the tip too quickly from your solution. Keep it in there as you're slowly releasing your thumb. Now we're going to put this, I'm going to put this on parafilm so that you guys can see this a little bit better. So this is my parafilm. It's kind of like wax paper. So we can actually utilize this to expel our drops. So same thing as before, I want to use a little adhesion and cohesion. So I'm going to stick this tip against the uh, parafilm with the wax paper. I don't want to go stabbing it because the wax could clog up the tip of it. But if I put it on the side like this and then I slowly release first push, second push, and then pull out, notice I have nothing left in the tip. Everything was expelled. That little second push, the little extra poof of air got everything out. Now if I absorb this back up, I want to go down to my first pushing stopping point. First stop, I'm going to stick that tip right into my little droplet there, see if I can do this backwards on the camera, and I want to slowly release it, and I want to absorb everything back up again. So there it is clean, there's my 27 microliters back into my pipette, so I'm just going to expel that right back into the tube that we've been utilizing. Once again, go through, eject the tip off. If it works, some of our cheaper micropipettes, unfortunately, they don't always work ejector-wise. Um, another reason we use food coloring. So, now I have some tubes. I have this little tube. Maybe I put a bunch of different colors in it. I have other equipment that I need to utilize and show what um, to mix some things up and to get them spun up and things like that. So you guys are going to be working with what is known as a vortex and a micro centrifuge. A vortex mixes things up. Let's say I had a tube, I only have one color in here, but let's say I put reds and blues and greens, or if this was DNA with, with some reactants to help, uh, help with a polymerase chain reaction to amplify my DNA, and I gotta start getting this stuff working together. I wanna mix it up. This is called a vortex, and that's exactly what it does. All you're gonna do is take your little tube, he set on auto, I can change the um, vibration strength of it. I'm just gonna put it down, and I'm pushing down on it and it will spin and mix everything up. You can put that wherever there's room. If there are four people waiting, you can stick all four of them on there. It doesn't matter. But what it's doing, as you can see, it's mixing up the solution within that particular tube. So that's a vortex. You guys will utilize that throughout the year as well. So now I have it and I might have some drops up to the top there. And I want to make sure everything is pushed down together. So now we have what is known as a micro centrifuge. This micro centrifuge spins things. It's kind of like the big old um, tilt-a-whirl or 
uh, the Gravitron ride at a carnival. So when you get on that Gravitron ride, or maybe you did as a kid, the guy who runs the ride, he basically tells you where to go because he doesn't want to stick two bigger people along one side and all the smaller people along the other side. Because when it spins, it's going to be off balance. It's kind of like if you've ever done a big load of towels with it in your washing machine and all those towels, for whatever reason, get pushed to one side and that little washing machine starts to walk across the floor because it's so unbalanced. This is what that micro centrifuge is like. So you will see, let's see if I can pull this up a little closer for you guys. There are little openings and holes within it. There's an inner row and there's an outer row and they are all numbered. So you know exactly where it is that you put your samples. The thing is you need to keep it balanced. So let's say I have two tubes and they've got about the same amount of solution in them. So I have two green ones. They've got basically um, one ml or a thousand microliters in them. When I put them into my Slanker centrifuge, I want to make sure that they are opposite one another. Think like a clock. I want to put it at 12 and 6, or 3 and 9, or 1 and 7. It doesn't matter. Make sure they're both in the same row. So here I have them both on the inside row. I don't want one on the outside row and one on the inside row. That could change things. I'm going to close up my lid. And there's a little button that says pulse. I'm actually going to flip it to the left side. I'm going to pulse it. And it's got a really nice little sound and it's spinning. Let it go a second. And what it's doing is it's pulling all those droplets down to the bottom. When you guys go and get blood taken, if you've ever had blood taken for some sort of chemistry test or something the doctor wants to check out and they come in with the tubes and those red tubes, they have that gooey stuff on the bottom. It looks like wax. That's basically what it's doing. When they take your blood, they spin it in this micro centrifuge and your heavy red blood cells, the red portion of it, get pushed down to the bottom because they're really dense. That waxy stuff in between is called a serum separator. That makes its way to the middle because that's the second dense one. And then your liquid portion, which is known as plasma or serum, comes up to the top. That's what they want to test. So it's a serum separator, separating out the liquid portion of your blood. And this is how they do it. They spin things at high speeds and they pull all the heavy stuff down to the bottom. Here, I just did plain old water, but basically all my droplets are pushed up into the big mass here. I don't stuff against the top. But when you take things out, you don't want to start twisting them and flipping them upside down because now we're right back where we were before. Let's say you only have one tube left to spin. You have one tube left to spin. I can't balance one tube. So along the way, you guys will see things called blanks. Blanks are empty tubes. Actually, they're filled with water because you want to make sure they have the same amount in them. So if I was doing this tube by itself and I need to spin it, so I go through and I vortex it, and now I'm like, oh, I want to spin it, but it's by itself, I would pull the blank out of the container. It's filled only with water, but they are about the same size. I go, great, let me put them in there. They're balanced from each other. They're across from each other. Let me pulse it for a couple seconds. Pull all that liquid down to the bottom. I'm good. And now I can get my amount checked, which is what they're going to be doing in the classroom. There are also small blanks here. You're going to go, what's a small blank? Well, it only has a tiny amount of liquid in it. Can I use this if I have a lot of liquid in my tube? So let's say I have this and I've got this. Some people are going to go, yep. So I'm going to put them in. I'm going to put them across from each other. They're balanced. That's perfect. They're at 12 and 6. They're on the inside row. I've got two tubes. That's the noise you're going to hear. That's kind of like that washing machine that's ready to walk across the floor. That means it's not balanced. So when you hear that noise, whoever does it, you're going to turn around and look at them real quick. But if it's you, you want to make sure you stop pulsing the machine and you pull out your tubes. That could also happen. Maybe they are the same amount, but you don't have them balanced across from each other. You can balance three tubes, you can balance four tubes, you can balance as many tubes as long as they're, as they're arranged across from each other. So I can go 12 and six on the inside row. I can go one and seven along the outside row. It doesn't matter. I can go two large amounts on the inside. I can go two smaller amounts on the outside as long as they're balanced, as long as they're across from each other. You can always use blanks. They're always gonna be at your micro centrifuges within the room. Okay, so that's basic setup that they're gonna have. There is a video within the lab itself that you guys are gonna click on. So it's not my voice, but at least you'll be able to see some more and they'll go through the step-by-step -step with you. Um, and then you guys will be finishing up the conversions as well as the activity that goes through this, okay? 
if there are questions or if there's any time that you guys want to be like, hey, I'm going to come in to school for this day or whatever, you guys want to work with these, please do so. This is a great skill to have, especially if you're going into the field of science, uh, forensics, anything like that, that measures small amounts, pharmacy, you'll be actually using these. Um, and it's good skill to have before you get to college and you know how to use them so that others in your class, you're kind of teaching them and it kind of makes you guys look good and know what you know what you're doing. So um, hopefully that helps you guys a little bit. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.